Hi, in this video, I'm going to start a topic patterns in the chemical world. And in this video, I'm going to focus on the first two items. So let's get started. Now, first of all, periodicity. Do you still remember this term? Now, periodicity basically means that across the periodic table, no matter you go across the period or down the group, there are some recurring pattern. So periodicity is talking about this recurring pattern that is exhibited on the periodic table. Now down here, this one is basically outlining all the bonding and structure of period 2 elements as well as period 3 elements. And from there, we are able to observe some periodic recurring pattern. So first of all, we can focus on the bonding. We see that from left to right, from lithium all the way to uh, neon, we see that the bonding changes gradually from metallic bond to covalent bond. Okay. Similar idea also observed it in period 3. You see, from sodium all the way to argon, the bonding changes from metallic bond to covalent bond. So this is the first periodic pattern that we are able to observe. Then we move on to the structure. We see that the structure changes from giant metallic structure to simple molecular structure, and in between we have giant covalent structure. Okay. Similar idea also appears in period three. So you see on the left we have giant metallic structure, on the right we have simple molecular structure, and in between we have giant covalent structure. Okay. So these are the two. A periodic trend that we can observe regarding bonding and structure. So down here, let's underline it. So first of all, regarding the bonding across the period, the element changes from metallic to covalent. Okay. The second one is about the structure. So again, across the period, the element changes from giant metallic structure to simple molecular structure. And in between, we have giant covalent structure. Okay. Now, number three and number four here may not be that obvious when we're simply looking at the periodic table. So, first of all, we say that the atomic radius, atomic radius, basically referring to atomic size. So, going across the period, the atomic radius will decrease. So, across the period, atomic radius decreases. Okay? And down a group, down a group, the atomic radius increases. Now, down a group, the atomic radius increases. This one should be easy to understand because when you go down a group, you have more and more occupied electron shell. Therefore, they will be bigger in size. That makes sense. But across the period, they have the same number of occupied electron shell. Um, however, the atomic radius will decrease. This one, you don't really have to know why. This is basically one of the trends that you need to recognize um, to help you to uh, remember this when you do revision, it will be best to draw, draw out something. So you can put down something like this. Um, let's just say period two, so lithium will be like this, and then going to uh, beryllium, maybe a little bit smaller. I'm going to boron, it's smaller, okay? And this is a little bit exaggerated, but this is just to show you um, the periodic trend, okay? Oh, maybe like this, fluorine is even smaller, okay? Uh, neon is actually very small as well. Okay, so that kind of gives you the idea that moving from left to right, the atomic radius decreases. Okay, and going down a group, so we have neon over here. Uh, if you have an argon, then argon should be bigger than that. And then after argon, we will have krypton. So krypton should even be bigger than that. Okay, so when you do revision, when you see something like this, you quickly recollect the memory of this particular feature. Okay, now number four here regarding electronegativity. You should have learned this one when we talk about redox as well as the microscopic world too. Across the period, the electronegativity actually increases. Okay, so you recognize that fluorine is the most electronegative species and it is on the right-hand side of the periodic table. Also, down a group, now this one is across the period, and down a group, the electronegativity decreases. Okay, so if you look at, for example, 
group 7 halogen, uh, fluorine is the most electronegative one, and fluorine is more electronegative than chlorine, chlorine is more electronegative than bromine, something like that. Okay, So these are some periodic variations or some uh, periodic trend that we can observe on a periodic table. And this trend will happen on period 2, also happen in period 3, something like that. So these patterns are recurring, and that's why we call this periodicity, okay? recurring patterns. Now, to the right-hand side here, we have two practice questions, but these are quite easy. Let's do it together. Now, uh, which of the following substance have their atoms joined by strong covalent bonds? So which of these are covalent substance, basically? Now, beryllium is a metal. So this guy is a metal and definitely having metallic bond, right? So this one is definitely wrong. Boron is actually a semi-metal and it actually has covalent bond and it has a giant covalent structure, but never, never mind, uh, all we are focusing on is the covalent bonds. So this one is correct. Fluorine is of course a non-metal and of course it has covalent bond. So the answer is C, 2 and 3. Moving down here, boron and aluminium are both group 3 elements. Which of the following statement is correct? Both of them are metals. Now, aluminium is a metal, but boron is a, uh, a semi-metal, so the statement is not correct. Both of them are giant metallic structure. Aluminium has a giant metallic structure, but boron has a giant covalent structure, so not correct. Good conductor of electricity, only for aluminium. Boron is not. It's a semi-metal, so it is simply a conductor of electricity, but the conductivity varies according to temperature. Only when the temperature is high, then the conductivity of semi-metal will be high. If it is at room temperature, um, they are just a fair conductor of electricity. So this is not correct. And lastly, they have the same number of outermost shell electron. This one must be correct because they are group 3. So they all have 3 outermost shell electron. So the answer is D. Alright? So C and D. Now moving on to the next page, this one is nothing new. It's simply a revision of bonding and structure and how bonding and structure has to do with the physical properties such as melting point. Okay, now you know melting point depends on first of all the structure and if the elements are having the same structure then we move on to the bonding. We want to see uh, which bonding is stronger. Okay, all right, when you look at this graph it is showing you the melting point variation for period 2 elements and period 3 elements. So um, this one is uh, the period 3 and the purple one ooh, is definitely period 2. Now I think period 3 is more familiar than period 2. I think you guys are more familiar with period 3 than period 2. So let's focus on period 3 uh, at the beginning. So if you look at period 3, you notice that sodium, magnesium, aluminium, so these are all metals, right? and they have relatively high melting point. Sodium may have a relatively low melting point, but uh, in general, they have a higher melting point. Okay, so we see. So first of all, the first observation is that uh, elements in group 1, group 2, group 3, they are generally having high melting point. And the reason is because they are all metal except boron. And for these metals, they all have strong electrostatic attraction between metal cation and the delocalized electrons. Okay. Now, we also observe that the melting point increases from group 1 to group 3. So you see sodium, magnesium, aluminium. Aluminium is having the highest melting point. Okay. Similar idea is also observed in group 2. Now, how do we explain this? Now, first of all, all of them are metal except boron. Huh? So when we have to compare the melting point of all metals, so they have all so they all have giant metallic structure. So therefore we have to compare the strength of metallic bond. Knowing that moving to from group one to group three, the number of delocalized electrons increases, and also the charge density of metal can increases. 
So remember, charge density has to do with not only the charge, but also the size of the ion. So you can tell, uh, sodium ion is like this, Mg ion may be like this, and aluminum ion is even smaller. So of course, aluminum 3 plus is having the highest charge and the smallest ionic radius. Therefore, the charge density is the highest. Okay? So for aluminum, it has the greatest number of the localized electron plus the highest charge density and perhaps the highest packing efficiency. And all this reason will account for the stronger electrostatic attraction between metal cation and the delocalized electrons. And at the end of the day, it has the strongest metallic bond and therefore the highest melting point uh, among the three species of the same period. Okay? Also, we compare elements of the same group. So you notice that period two metals are having higher melting point than period three metals. Okay? See, in general, the purple curve is lying on top of the pink curve. Now, the reason is because, uh, now first of all, they are all metals, so we again have to compare the metallic bonding strength. So first of all, because we're comparing elements of the same group, they all have the same number of delocalized electrons. So group one, one electrons, group two, two electrons, right? Now, um, however, if you compare the two ions, let's just say we focus on group two, which is having beryllium two plus versus magnesium two plus. Knowing that magnesium two plus is this size and Mg two plus is much larger, then when you compare the charge density, of course, Mg2 plus is having a lower charge density. Okay, so period three metals are having lower charge density because they are bigger in size and they have the same charge. Therefore, it leads to a lower packing efficiency. And you know, when it packed less close, then the distance between ions will be longer. Okay, and at the end of the day, the electrostatic attraction between the metal ions and the delocalized electrons decreases. So with a weaker metallic bond among group three elements, I mean group three metal ions and the delocalized electron, that accounts for the lower melting point. Okay? So all of these are actually some revision of form four bonding and structure concept. Now moving on to I think group four. Now you see group 4 elements are having the highest melting point within this period because they all have, of course, the giant covalent structure. Giant covalent structure. And the atoms are held strongly by the covalent bonds. If you have to melt it, you need to break all the bonds to melt, which is very, very difficult, requiring a very high temperature. So that's why they have very high melting point. Now, five here, carbon has a higher melting point than silicon simply because carbon is smaller in size, so the bond length for carbon-carbon bond is shorter than silicon-silicon bond. Therefore, with a shorter bond length, there will be a greater bond strength. Therefore, the melting point of carbon is higher than silicon. Okay, so it all boils down to the size, therefore, longer bond length, therefore weaker bond strength. Okay? Now number six here, elements from group five to group zero have relatively low melting point. Now that makes sense because they all have simple molecular structure. So they are only held by weak van der Waals force only. Okay? Now seven here, molecules in period three are having higher melting point than molecules in period two. So looking at here, now, just now, when we're looking at the metals, we say that uh, the period two metals are having higher melting point than period three metals, simply because they are smaller, so their charge density is higher. However, when it comes to molecules, you realize that now, period two molecules are having lower boiling point than period three molecules. Again, it has to do with the size, but this time, when it comes to molecules, when it comes to Van der Waals force, the bigger the molecular size is, the stronger the van der Waals force. So that's why this time period three molecules are having higher boiling point than the period two counterparts, okay? So down here, the reason 
molecules in period three are bigger in size, right? Bigger in size, okay? Because they have one more occupied electron shell, therefore the molecules are held by stronger than the Wilds force, okay? So here, uh, it would be best if you put down bigger in molecular size. Bigger in molecular size, okay? And lastly, this one is something special. This one is something new that you need to pay attention to, and very often, past paper would like to ask about this. Okay, now if you look at period three, particularly period three, uh, it's quite strange for period three molecules. Now you see, phosphorus, silicon, chlorine, argon. Now you notice that sulfur is having an exceptionally high boiling point when compared to the rest of its members of the same period. Now if you look at period 2, this trend is quite um, typical. You see basically um, the boiling point decreases, okay, uh, basically they have similar boiling points. However, for period 3, you see sulfur is having exceptionally high boiling point. And why is that? Well, the reason it has to do with the number of atoms involving in the molecules. Okay, if you look at here, if you look at the molecular formula, you see sulfur is actually existing as S8, S8. Okay, this one essentially looks like this. Sulfur atom, 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 sulfur atom. Sulfur atom. Sulfur atom. Okay, like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it looks like a crown shape. Okay like a crown on top of a king's hat, right? So sulfur naturally exists as S8 molecule. So that's why the molecular size is very large, okay? Now you see phosphorus, it exhibits as P4. So it is like this. It's like a pyramid, it's like a pyramid, okay? So it's a P4 molecule, it's like a pyramid. So you can tell, the boiling points of molecules depends on the molecular size. The larger it is, the stronger the van der Waals force between molecules. That's why S8 is having the highest boiling point, because it has the larger size. Followed by P4, followed by Cl2, followed by argon. Okay, so you need to memorize this fact, okay? Now, move on to the next page where we focus on the variation in electrical conductivity. Okay, now again, we say that only metals and metalloid and also graphite can conduct electricity. All the other non metals, they are unable to conduct electricity. Okay, bear in mind that. For metals, the electrical conductivity depends on the number of mobile delocalized electrons. Okay, now. That's why if you look at here, the trend, you see only the metals, only the members on the left hand side can conduct electricity well. And of course, carbon in form of graphite also conduct electricity and also some of the metalloid like boron, silicon, they can conduct electricity to some extent. But you look at these bunch of non-metals on the right hand side, they all do not conduct electricity, okay? Now, first of all, let's look at number one here. Metals have high electrical conductivity, and non-metals are insulator. Metalloids have low electrical conductivity at room temperature. This is what I just mentioned. Um, when it comes to explanation, actually, you guys know it. For metals, they have giant metallic structure, so there's a sea of delocalized dead mobile electrons. Okay. However, most non-metals have simple molecular structure. So there are no mobile delocalized electrons, okay? Remember, when it comes to electrical conductivity, you are looking for either mobile ions or mobile electrons. If you don't have mobile ions or mobile electrons, you can't conduct electricity. That's the idea. Metalloids with giant covalent structure display very little electrical conductivity at room temperature, okay? Very little electrical conductivity, okay? At room temperature. However, they become good conductor at elevated temperature or with impurities. Okay? Some non-metal when it is mixed with other substances, they are able to have 
uh, more enhanced electrical conductivity. Okay, for uh, point number two here, electrical conductivity of metal increase from group one to group three. That is basically due to the fact that you have more number of delocalized electrons per atom. Okay, you see the number of delocalized mobile electron increases. Okay, and more delocalized electrons are contributed to electrical conduction. And three here, graphite conducts electricity while diamond does not. Okay, we did talk about this when we talk about microscopic world too. Okay, because now you notice that carbon allotropes, we have several different carbon allotropes, and all of them have giant covalent structure, bear in mind that. But graphite has a very special structure. We say that each carbon atom is only bonded to three other carbon atoms, and one electron is delocalized. Okay? And that delocalized electron can contribute to electrical conduction. Okay? For diamond, carbon atom is bonded to four other carbon atoms. So there are no delocalized electrons. All the bonding electrons or all the valence electrons of carbon atoms are fixed at the CC single bond. So there is no electrons available to be delocalized. Okay? So you see, no mobile electrons are available. Okay? So remember the structure, right? Carbon, the graphite, is like this, right? They form hexagonal sheets of carbon atom, and in between the sheets, okay, they're held by weak van der Waals force, you remember? And we also have delocalized electron. Okay, this is for graphite, for diamond, for diamond it is having uh, these structures. Do you still remember how to draw these structures? I can barely draw it. Just kidding, of course I know how to draw it. You see each carbon atom is bonded to four other carbon atoms, right? So there's no mobile electrons available. Okay. Now again, we have some practice question. Again, we can do this together. It's not, it's not going to be difficult. Now, which of the following metals have the highest melting point? Highest melting point. So, of course, we will be focusing on the ions. Okay? Now, here, lithium ions, Li+, calcium ion, Ca2+, potassium ion, K+, magnesium ion, Mg2+. Okay? Now, of course, the 2 plus is better than the 1 plus, so we are looking at the calcium and magnesium. And knowing that magnesium is in period 2, sorry, period 3, and calcium is on period 4, so magnesium should have a higher charge density. So the metallic bond involved in magnesium should be higher than calcium. Therefore, D should have the highest melting point. Okay? You can also think about it. Both lithium and potassium are group 1 metal, and group 1 metal are known to have low melting point as a metal, isn't it? So this is not too difficult to deduce. Now question 2 here, which of the following statement concerning about period 2 element is correct? So melting point increase across the period, well, should be decreased, right? Or I would say increase first and then decrease. Electronegativity increase across the period. This one must be correct. For all the period, the electronegativity increase across the period. Okay, so the answer is B. Uh, electrical conductivity does not increase, uh, right? Because those non-metals are unable to conduct electricity, right? Except for carbon. Now, uh, all solid elements have, of course, wrong. Think about graphite, think about carbon. It is having giant covalent structure, uh, which is a member of non-metal on period 2. Okay. Now, 3 here, indium is a group 3 element at period 5, which of the following statement is correct? It is a metalloid. Uh, actually, it is not, because when we talk about the metalloid, uh, it exhibits a diagonal relationship. So, what do you mean by diagonal relationship? Uh, here, if you look at the periodic table, and when we are talking about the metalloid, the metalloid, so the metalloid, we have boron, right? We have silicon, okay? We have germanium, we have astatine, 
we have stick night, we have tellurium, something like that. So you see, the non-metal boundary, uh, something like that, or the distribution is following a diagonal trend. So it's moving diagonally. It's not vertically, it's not horizontally, but it's diagonally. Okay? Therefore, the indium guy is over here, and indium is actually a metal. Okay? It's actually a very useful metal uh, for superconductor or computer chips. So uh, it's not a metalloid, it's a metal. Uh, it has a higher melting point than aluminum. Well, I doubt that because both of them are group 3, but going down the group, you get a bigger uh, ionic radius. So probably the charge density is lower. It has a higher electrical conductivity than boron. This one, I think so, because at room temperature, uh, boron should have a very low electrical conductivity. It's a semi-metal, right? It forms positive ion with plus three charges by gaining three electrons. Well, it should be losing, right? So this one is wrong. So the answer is C, okay? So D, B, C. All right, next page. Now, over here, we are going to talk about some oxides of the elements. Now, here we will pay attention to only the oxides of period 3 elements. And now, please pay attention that here we are talking about the oxides. So these are all chemical compounds. However, just now, all this discussion, we are focusing on the elements itself. Okay? Now, for these oxides, first of all, pay attention to the formula and the name of the oxide, you notice that some of them can form more than one possible oxide. However, the one that I have underlined it should be the one that we commonly see in DSE. Right? Now, first of all, I want you to look at the bonding and structure. Now this time, you notice that from left to right, the oxide will change from ionic to covalent. Okay? And for the structure, obviously it changes from giant ionic structure to simple molecular structure. And we have one example, silicon dioxide, that has giant covalent structure. Okay, so you see the periodic trend, the periodic variation. Now, here, the question is, why the metal oxide are ionic, whereas the non-metal oxides are covalent? Now, Actually, it has to do with the electronegativity. Now, first of all, you know that oxygen is actually quite electronegative, right? So, oxygen, if it has to form an ion, it is going to form a negative ion. And you know it has to be oxide ion, O2 minus, right? Now, if you look at the metal metallic elements, now they all have very low electronegativity, meaning that they are very willing to lose electron. They do not interested in attracting electrons uh, all to themselves. So when we have the metal pairs with the non-metal, the best arrangement of electron is to have the metal donating electron to the oxygen atom, therefore forming ionic compounds. Okay. On the other hand, if you talk about non-metals like phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine. But these non-metals have relatively high electronegativity, even though they are not as electronegative than oxygen. But having these non-metals elements uh, losing electrons to form positive ion may not be that suitable. So instead of transferring electrons, they would rather go for sharing electron. So that's why they will form covalent oxide rather than ionic oxide. Okay? So basically, this is what it talks about down here, basically explaining the nature of bonding of these oxides and why, okay? Now down here, this one shows you some acid-base property of oxides. Um, basically, the oxide changes from basic to acidic. And in, this, in the middle here, we have something called enfoteric, enfoteric. And I will explain to you the meaning of enfoteric later. But at least you know, changing from basic, basic oxide to acidic oxide. Basic oxide means when they react with water, they can form alkaline. Whereas acidic oxide will react with water to form an acidic solution. Okay? 
Now on the right hand side here, you see, wow, so many equations. Yes, this part you need to spend some time, spend some hard work to memorize these equations. Basically talking about the acid-base behavior when it interacts with water. Now first of all, basic oxide, so for example sodium oxide, magnesium oxide. When they react with water, they will form an alkaline solution, like sodium hydroxide here, uh, magnesium hydroxide here. Okay. Uh, of course, these basic oxide will react with acid vigorously to form a salt and water, and this is known as neutralization, right? So these are relatively simple. Now here, amphoteric oxide. Now please pay extra attention to this one because this is frequently asked in the exam. Amphoteric oxide. Now first of all, what do you mean by amphoteric? Amphoteric basically means this substance exhibit both acidic and basic property okay exhibit both acid and basic property now aluminum oxide is one of these amphoteric species and we have other amphoteric species as well now here and you look at this equation AlTO3 when it reacts with acid it will form aluminum ion and water now here this equation is showing you aluminum oxide is able to react with acid to form a relatively neutral product so this equation telling you that aluminum oxide has a basic property okay so if you want to use the equation to illustrate the basic property of aluminum oxide this is the equation you need to use of course the H plus could be hydrochloric acid could be sulfuric acid you just sub in the corresponding acid uh, according to what the question asks you now here this is something that you need to memorize perhaps now, for aluminum oxide, it can also exhibit acidic property. In order to review the acidic property of aluminum oxide, we may as well react with a base, such as a sodium hydroxide. Okay? When you react with sodium hydroxide, basically the hydroxide ion, it will form this complex ion. Complex ion. Okay? Now, this equation is a new equation of which you need to memorize. Okay? So, this equation basically showing you or illustrating the acidic property of aluminum oxide. Okay? And one more very important thing is that aluminum oxide, despite of having both acidic property and basic property, it is insoluble in water. Insoluble in water. Okay? Now you notice that here we say that amphoteric species can have acidic and basic property. Doesn't mean that they are acid doesn't mean that they are alkaline because if you know that if something that is an acid it must be able to dissolve in water to give H plus right this is the definition but definitely Al2O3 is not an acid otherwise it will be soluble in water isn't it so bear in mind aluminum oxide is an amphoteric species meaning that it has acidic property and basic property but doesn't mean that it is an acid okay so do memorize these two equations are very important equations now down here these are the reaction between different acidic oxide towards uh, water or towards base. And this equation, you may need to spend some time to memorize them. Now, first of all, we have the silicon dioxide. Now, silicon dioxide is insoluble in water. However, it is slightly, slightly acidic, slightly acidic. So it is able to react with strong alkaline to form soluble silicate ion and water. So that's why glassware made of quartz or glassware containing silicon dioxide should not be used to contain strong concentrated alkaline okay otherwise the glass will be slowly eroded or degraded by the sodium hydroxide okay now phosphorus pentoxide p4o10 this guy will react vigorously with water to give phosphoric acid and this is a weak tribasic acid, if you remember. Okay, so this reaction is very vigorous. Bear in mind that. Now down here, sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide, these two uh, sulfur oxides are very common. Now, sulfur dioxide reacts with water to form sulfur rust acid, ah, sulfur rust acid, H2SO3, which is a weak dibasic acid. Now, pay attention to this equation, it will be best if you use a reversible sign um, for this reaction. Okay. However, sulfur trioxide reacts vigorously and 
exothermically to form sulfuric acid uh, in water. So this one, because it's so vigorous, we will use a single-headed arrow to describe this equation. Okay, and this reaction is known to be very exothermic. Okay. Now the last one, dichlorine monoxide and also this dichlorine heptoxide. So both oxide will react with water to form acid. For dichlorine monoxide, it will react with water to form HOCl, hypochlorous acid, which is a weak acid. Hypochlorous acid is a weak acid. Okay. And Cl2O7 will react with water to form perchloric acid which is a strong acid. So you notice, forming strong acid, single-headed arrow. And here, forming a weak acid, we use a reversible arrow. Okay? So that's it for this video.